it is a difficult process. What I do is totally handmade. So if you make any mistakes, you take different seed varieties, you take different land, you take different positioning of, of where the tobacco is located. That completely changes the flavor of the tobacco. So from there, you can get thousands of different op, uh, potential blend combinations, billionaires, blue collared workers, musicians, artists, all of these different types of people come to this one place that normally I don't think would ever spend time together. So I've never done an intro for one of these videos, so I don't, I don't really know what to do. But thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to Profoundly Pointless. If you get a chance, like and subscribe. Our guest this week is Cigar Blender and founder of Foundation Cigars, Nicholas Malillo. So is it hard to make a cigar or is it hard to make a cigar well? I, I would say both. It, it seems easy when you, when you see the process, but it's very entailed and there's a lot of nuance to it. And it is a difficult process. There's a lot of hands. It's totally, what I do is totally handmade. So if you make any mistakes, they can cause many pr problems way down the line. Is that when you look at like the quality of a cigar? Is it the ingredients going into it? Is it the way it's made? It, it starts with really good black tobacco is what we call cigar tobacco. So we, we call cigar tobacco black, dark, air-cured tobacco, which is very different from, say, what's used in cigarette, which is what we call flu-cured um, or bright, burlies, uh, different types of tobacco. Those tobaccos are cured when they come out of the fields, say, within a week's time, where cigar tobacco is naturally fermented over years. Um, so basically what we're doing is controlled composting almost. So we take tobacco in hands in 7,000 pound piles and just the combination of moisture from the leaf and pressure from the weight of the pile triggers the fermentation process. Um, so quality tobacco, there, there, there's a lot to that. And that's the beginning of being able to have time and the resources to age tobacco properly um, and, and having really, you know, grade A top tobacco. That's, that's where it all starts uh, when having a really good ultra premium cigar. This and then the next is the construction and the blend and how it's put together. So cigar smoke is really different than, you know, cigarette smoke. Is it different than pipe smoke? Like, is it completely its own thing? It is 100% its own thing. So complete, you can't use cigarette grade tobaccos for cigar, handmade cigars, nor can you use pipe tobaccos um, for cigars. So they're completely different seed varieties. They're grown in different regions, completely different than handmade cigars. Now, machine-made cigars is a whole different thing, but uh, I deal with, again, strictly handmade. How long will it take you then to make one, right, from... Not not counting when the crop the crop is planted, right? But from like right after we start the process, like how long is it going to take? So after the the tobacco comes from the fields, it goes into fermentation. Let's say that can range depending anywhere from one to three years, sometimes four years, and then it could age in bales for another year. And then it's passed to the production floor. And then after the cigar is rolled, they usually cure, uh, I'm sorry, age in humidors down in where I'm at in Nicaragua for another 90 days before they're shipped. So you're talking three years, I would say, on an average. Wow. And then how long will yeah. it take you to like hand roll them? So hand rolling, usually, a, uh, you know, a day, a, we work in pairs in Nicaragua. So every country has a, maybe a little different style that they, they use to roll cigars. They work in pairs. So someone bunches what we call the filler leaves, the inside of the cigar, and then a roller puts on the wrapper leaf. And usually a pair can make anywhere from 
200 to 400 cigars a day. Now, does does the other stuff around the cigar matter? Or is it basically like, look, the tobacco is X percent of it. And the roll itself is like, it just makes it look cool. The tobacco, again, is the, the pillar. If you don't roll them properly, you're going to have a terrible user experience. So if the, if the cigar doesn't draw properly, if it's too loose, it's going to burn too hot. It's going to affect the blend. Construction is crucial in having a good user experience. So over the years, I've seen companies go out of business because they've had major quality control problems that you can't go back to. You know, people are spending, you know, anywhere from five to twenty, thirty dollars a cigar. People work hard. The last thing you want is when you're relaxing is to light up a cigar that doesn't draw, that doesn't burn, that doesn't taste properly. So the construction and quality control of actually rolling them. That's what I, I managed for 12 years. I, I started in Nicaragua in 2003 with one of the smallest cigar factories in, in Nicaragua. And I left in 2014. We were the largest handmade cigar factory in Nicaragua. So I was overseeing 105,000 handmade cigars a day. And my main my main role was quality control. <coughs> Excuse me. Quality control was uh, a crucial part of my everyday job. How did you get started in it? Like, what was the initial kind of draw for you? So Connecticut, people don't, I'm from Connecticut. People don't realize that Connecticut grows some of the best cigar tobacco in the world, north of Hartford, Connecticut. There is a valley called the, yeah, it's usually the Connecticut. So Connecticut's relationship with Cuba pre-1959, Cuba and Connecticut had a very old relationship in um, as you know, maybe many places in the United States had cigar factories. Here in Connecticut, there was a ton of cigar factories in the early 1900s. All of the cigars produced here used Cuban filler, so the inside of the cigar, and the outside was Connecticut wrapper. We were really known for the outside leaf, which is a whole different growing process. But Connecticut actually means in, in Mohawk, um, Mohegan, I'm sorry, along the Great Tidal River. So the Connecticut River is 406 miles long. It passes through four states. It starts on the border of New Hampshire and Canada. It used to be a gigantic finger lake at the end of the last ice age. It was called Lake Hitchcock. It was gigantic. Eventually, that lake eroded and broke and started funneling into the Long Island Sound. But it left 30,000 acres north of Harford, this very sandy loam soil that was perfect for growing black, dark air cured tobacco for cigars. So this goes back to the late 1600s. And before that, of course, the indigenous communities have used tobacco for, you know, we think 5,000, 5,000 years. So so Connect, being from Connecticut, I grew up, all my family smoked Connecticut cigars. My great-grandfathers smoked cigars out of factories in New Haven, Connecticut. My grandfathers. So when I was 18, I, I was the cigar guy. I, I just fell in love with cigars after sharing one with my grandfather. It was an amazing experience to be able to sit down, you know, when you're 18 and have a cigar with your grandfather. It was sort of a coming of, of age. And I graduated high school and I used to go into this cigar shop called Calabash Shop. And there was lines out the humidor. There was two women that ran that owned the shop. And this one particular day, I get all the way up to the cash register after waiting in the line. And I said, listen, I'd love to work for you guys. I know every cigar in that humidor. I know the whole process. I would love to work for you guys. And I didn't hear from them for two months. And a week before I started university, they called me. And that's how I got my start in the industry. So I started running the cigar shop while I was studying international business at, at university. Then I'm like, but starting your own company then, right? Did, was that like the, always the goal? Or was that just the opportunity was no. there and I jumped on I, it? So I, you know, I, I run this, this cigar shop for all of my university four years and I met this 
crazy guy from New York who was starting a cigar factory in Nicaragua. And we met in 98 and kept in touch over about a five year period. I left school and I, I always just wanted to travel. So I, I circumnavigated the globe. I went to Italy. I lived in Rome and worked with the Vatican and then bought an around the world ticket and went through uh, India, Southeast Asia. So this gentleman that I had met was on my email list. So I'm traveling all around the world. <clears throat> Going to Nicaragua in the early 2000s wasn't really a thing. So I think he, as he's getting my emails emerging from, you know, Southeast Asia, he said, oh, I, you know, Nick will probably come live in Nicaragua. So he, he offered me a job to go work in, in Nicaragua in March of 2003. So I was traveling around the world for a year. I got back to the States for a month and then moved down to Nicaragua and, and have been down there the majority of my time over the past 18 years. 18 years. So I helped this company. And then at one point I said, you know, if, if I'm working this hard, I should probably start my own company. And, uh, it was tough to make that decision. Is it a profitable business? I mean, obviously it's a profitable business, right? But are we talking like, once you get going, this is easy money or you got to scrape for everything that you got. It's, it's definitely not easy, man. We have a very, interesting perception because we're selling leisure and relaxation so there's this outside perception that oh man that would be so cool to work with cigars and oh, that must be the greatest job ever behind the scenes it is a very difficult business and it, the money is good but it takes a lot of money to get started and a lot of you know just think about three years of fermentation, you're sitting on money oh, for yeah. three years before. And that distinguishes what makes a really ultra premium cigar and not, you can ferment tobacco much faster. And that's what's happening is a lot of people are, they don't have the money to sit on tobacco for three years, you know, but they can cure it really fast, get it out in the product, but there's a tremendous difference in flavor. It, it's it's almost like my grandmother's pasta sauce. I'm Italian. My family's Italian. It's the difference between popping open a can of sauce, throwing it on the stove, cooking it, and my grandmother, slow heat, eight hours a day, fresh ingredients, and preserving. Once you start turning that heat up, you start losing a lot of the good goodness the the flavor right, to the right. elements and once you do it fast so it's slow and steady which really preserves the natural oils and flavor and it's the same with cigar tobacco Th this may be stereotyping a little bit right but working in nicaragua and honduras in the early 2000s i would imagine that came with some extra stuff besides just normal business operations Man. yeah Ch at first it's ex you know, really exciting and you don't see the challenge. I was 24 and you're in a new place. You're, you're in a new culture. As time goes on, things get a little bit more, more challenging and culture. And I I'm in the North of Nicaragua. So I live in the place called Esteli, which is about two hours North of the capital. And it's pretty much a farming city town. And if you're a city person, it's a very difficult place to be after a while. But if it wasn't for the Nicaraguan people, I probably wouldn't be there till today. I mean, people welcomed me in and have treated me like a king um, and family. And they're very appreciative. You know, the north of Nicaragua, so many people are employed by the cigar industry. So many families eat from the cigar industry. And uh, it makes a huge difference because there's not many other options when it comes to jobs. Did you ever have to kind of go around any like criminal elements or am I being overly dramatic here? You, you, you're being a little overly dramatic. Okay. Uh, and I've seen I too many movies, and, right? <laughs> and most people do, you know, and I had that perception moving down there. People, it's one of the safest countries in Central America. So I feel safer in Nicaragua than I do in in cities here in Connecticut. 
what is it about that place? Like, why is that special? So, you know, Castro confiscates most of the cigar factories in 5960, most of the tobacco fields. So many Cuban families flee in the cigar world, uh, which people don't realize. Many of the master blenders and master tobacconists flee Cuba looking for similar climates as certain growing regions in Cuba. Pinar del Rio, there's an area, Vuelta Bajo. These are two very famous growing regions. So Nicaragua is has the most active volcanoes in Central America. Okay, the ring of fire. Nicaragua actually means in Nahuatl, the, the local language, the land of lakes and volcanoes. So there's two very large lakes and the volcanic soil is just so rich. And dark. I mean, you can just drop seeds and things are growing. So in the early 60s, mid 60s, Cubans started bringing Cuban seed to Nicaragua and they started getting incredible results. Um, the strength, the complexity of the leaf. If you see now with Cigar Aficionado, the top 25 cigars, 16 of the top 25 were from Nicaragua this past year. Uh, and most people, you know, don't realize is again, that many of the Cuban masters left Cuba. Um, if you're a cigar smoker, you know, a lot of times Cubans are just known because you can't get them. So like, okay, when I don't know anything about cigars and yes. I was born without a sense of smell. So my knowledge is never going to be very good, but like, what makes, in your opinion, like what makes a good cigar? What should I be looking for? So everybody has a different palate. This is the first thing is, is what's the best cigar in the world? The one you enjoy the most. So we're really as cigar shops and tobacconists trying to find the right blend for the right palate. So Usually someone that's newer to cigar smoking, tobacco is a powerful plant, uh, a, a very sacred, powerful plant. So you wouldn't give someone a blend that is very strong or, you know, something that would be can even, you know, rated high in cigar aficionado. If that's a stronger blend, usually a newer smoker is not going to enjoy something that's that's really strong. So you're looking for something milder. Um, you know, really just looking for something that's not jading the palate, that's not bitter, that's not, you know, overly strong. Balance is the key, right? I, I blend cigars. That's the, the trick in creating a good cigar is, is balance. Uh, and that takes just years of, of knowledge and know-how uh, and learning, you know, how tobaccos work together. But you get you want to find the right cigar for the right the right palate. So a lot of times people are just not educated or they don't get the right advice from maybe a cigar shop and they're given or they might get a cigar at a wedding or they might get one as a, a gift. And then they leave it in their house. It's not humidified. They smoke it a month later. It's dry. It's you know, it's dis it's disgusting. And then they smoke it and think that's what a cigar is. And that kind of deters a lot of people from smoking, smoking cigars. So it's all about finding the right cigar for the right consumer. N I hope I answered. No, your you question. did. Right. Like it, it can be kind of all like you have to find what's right for you. Like I drink enough whiskey that like now I know like, OK, I don't like that. I do like this. There you go. But at the beginning, it was just kind of like, well, it's all over the place, right? Yeah, yeah, and it's it's the same thing. Same thing with wine. You, our palates are are very interesting. It it really is the nose which is picking up uh, a lot of the flavor. You know, our palate has four to six thousand flavor receptors on it, and we're really registering the five major flavors. What is it? Sweet, salty. Uh, bitter, savory. It's like acid and I, in there somewhere. Yeah, acidic. I think you're right. Yeah. I, I can't believe I'm forgetting it. Like that. Sour. That's it. That's it. That's only five, you know, real flavors, really. Your olfactory has millions of receptors. So 
where are you getting the vanillas, the chocolates that that's actually coming from your olfactory? Um, and that's why people getting COVID, you know, a lot of times they're losing their sense of smell. You're really losing your sense of taste because if you lose your sense of smell, you're basically losing more than 50% of, of your taste. So that's really when you get into things and you see this with coffee or wine, really developing your your olfactory is crucial in really learning tobacco to that kind of next stage. So we don't inhale cigars, but we do something called retrohaling, which is basically where you're taking smoke and you're exhaling through your nose. And that's where you're kind of, you're, you're, that's when you really start getting into the next kind of level of flavor, understanding cigars. Oh, I see. So you're like, but you're not, you're like, yeah, it's just basically being funneled through the bag. It's never going into your lungs. Cigars are not intended to be inhaled into your lungs oh. at all. Do most people smoke cigars the right way? There's a lot of miseducation, I, I, I think, about cigars. And we're, we're really on a mission over the next five years is to really train people and consumers because it does – it does differentiate have, you know, people staying in our industry. We're such a small industry, Nick, you know, not many people smoke handmade cigars. It, it's a very small fraction of the population. And I think a lot of times it is because of education that people don't stay in it because they, they do have a, maybe a negative experience and they're not being shown properly. They're not being led first of all, to the right blend, you know? Um, and then they're not really knowledgeable of how to cut it and light it. Uh, properly which all affects the blend and the taste of the cigar so when you blend a cigar right like are most cigars blended or is it basically just one crop of tobacco like how do you how do you blend it so there i used generally for my blends for foundation cigars i'm using filler so the inside leaves are generally from nicaragua um, Nicaragua just has such rich, flavorful tobacco. This is why it's it's becoming more and more well known within the handmade cigar cigar world. So you take different seed varieties, you take different land, you take different positioning of, of where the tobacco is located. That completely changes the flavor of the tobacco so from there you can get thousands of different op, uh, potential blend combinations then you take the leaf that goes around the filler which is underneath the wrapper is called the binder that's holding the filler together that's usually from different countries um, connecticut ecuador grows cigar tobacco honduras the dominican republic sumatra is known for growing cigar tobacco. Brazil, there's an area called Bahia uh, in Brazil, which is one of the oldest tobacco growing regions. So from all these different options, you can create blends. And all these tobaccos kind of work differently together. And uh, it's, it's really about understanding the different flavor profiles and being able to put those together properly you know it's i think the difference of having i'm not i'm not the greatest cook but if you give you know certain ingredients to me and a real chef you're going to have two different you know very drastically different results so no you did i think that the question that i would have you know is like so when you when you go through a blend like how many will you try out before like okay this is the right one like how long will it take you to get to that final product for that variety? For me right now, with just the experience that I've had, I've, I've been able to develop my own techniques that I find work for what I'm looking to do. So generally I'm developing maybe seven to 10 at the most different blends. And then from those seven blends, I'm able to maybe make a little tweaks here and there and then get what I'm looking for. So like the cigar I'm smoking right now is called Olmec. It's our homage to actually Mexican San Andreas tobacco. 
which is San Andreas is one of the oldest growing regions in the world also. It actually predates the Cuban seed. But this took me seven blends. So seven blends, and I had the range where I was at, made a little tweak. What's happening before that, though, is what we call, I'm smoking what we call tabacchiados, where I'm reviewing bales of tobacco, and I'm inspecting bales and rolling little cigars and just smoking the bales to check for flavor. So I'll smoke individual components first, and then I'll end up bringing all those components together, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's kind of like if there was a line of, I use whiskey or scotch or whatever, it's kind of like you take a little sip and like, okay, that one's this place, and maybe I'll go with that one. Can you can you pretty much eyeball it? Like, can you look at a t- tobacco in its refined form or whatever and be like... <laughs> sweet sour can you look at it it depends on if i know who it's coming from and i know who's growing it the the main test for me is the aroma so the aroma and inspection of the aroma looking at it definitely you you're getting signs but you need kind of the three major the the touch the taste and the visual is going to give you everything you need so I would never really just go based on looks, although if a tobacco is green, you're going to know it's not cured properly. If it's too dark, sometimes it can get really black. That means it's been overly fermented. So it's almost like you burn it. So you can tell from that. I can tell a lot from the vein structure. Um, You're also, when you're inspecting leaf for the outside of the cigar, it has to be visually perfect. So wrapper leaf on the outside leaf is much thinner, silkier, and it needs to be perfect. Color, can't be any blemishes. It's the most expensive leaf in the blend because it has to be almost perfect. And you're dealing with natural, you know, you're dealing with crops. You're dealing with, you know, a natural product that's not being put together in a lab. And uh, it's not a widget, which I tell my customers a lot of times, you know, it's... uh, It's a very detailed process. How different is it? Can it be like, I know these are hard to kind of quantify, right? And I, my brain thinks in math terms, which isn't really the best way, but like how different, okay, you get this exact crop, same region, same guy growing it, same people working it, same, like how different can you expect things to be from year to year? They can be very different, man. I mean, we're growing right now in the Connecticut river Valley, right? So North of here, about where I'm fr- where I'm at, 40 minutes is is harvest time. So I'll be up there Friday. Har- Luckily, this year we've had a great year uh, with weather. Last year it was the w- rainiest Connecticut in 50 years. 20 percent of the crop made it through. Oh, God. so 20 percent. Most farmers had to plow under the fields because they get insurance money. Otherwise, there would be no industry up there. This year the crop is looking great. But you can see a beautiful crop in the fields. It goes then to the curing barns where it needs to go for another 70, 75 days. If you don't know what you're doing in the curing barn or you're not paying attention, that beautiful crop in the field field can go to crap overnight if you're not looking at it properly. It's the same thing then when it goes to years in fermentation. You know, guys would see me in, in, in front of fermentation pile, 7,000 pound piles. And oh man, that's the coolest job. It's a great, there's nothing more stressful than having tobacco and fermentation because it can be destroyed literally overnight if you're not paying attention. And it can then damage the flavor and it can completely affect the blends that you're trying to come out with. So there's a lot that goes into it. You got to be on it all the time. Otherwise, it can it can go bad pretty quick, and then you're you're out not only money and investment, but then the time you can't you can't get back. So you could be curing tobacco for two years. You have all that time and money. If it goes bad, and you don't have a backup, then you don't have production. Mother Nature doesn't give you a second chance, does it? It doesn't. It doesn't. Brutal in its honesty. <laughs> right it it really is and that's why our industry it, it does seem really simple from the outside 
but when you're when you're in it it's what seems simple is very detail oriented and complex are you ready for some harder slash listener submitted questions i would love it best place to smoke a cigar front porch bar or other if i had to choose i would say front porch yeah you know just for, for me again it depends on what kind of mood you're in but front porch in a book or some good company that that's the place you know i grew up my father built a little little house we called it it was one of these prefab sheds yeah 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 i know what you're talking about he he ended up putting a little pellet stove in there a rug and a table and that's where you know my grandfather and my brother and i would would have a cigar and that was heaven so i i tend to lean on the more peaceful you know settings and environments Although a cigar bar could be cool on a Friday night. What's really better, smoking the cigar or holding the cigar? <laughs> smoking the cigar. There's some, okay, I will admit to this, and I think one of our listeners called me out on this. I don't smoke cigars, but if I've had some uh, edibles, which I really enjoy edibles, I like the feeling of holding a cigar. There's something about cool. it that makes me feel kind of cool. Like, what do you think it is about it? It's a good question, man. I never really thought of it at length. But it's it's like almost something that, it's like your companion almost. You know, you don't feel, whereas if you're just alone and you got nothing, you're kind of like, you know, you got nothing. But a cigar is like, oh, man, this is cool. It's got a cool kind of perception. And it, it, I would say it's like your companion. There's something just kind of cool about it. This, this, yeah. this leads into another question, though. And maybe this is, I, this person's not trying to be offensive. I think they're actually asking this question. How can I make sure that I don't look, they use the words douchey holding a cigar? Because I've noticed looking at people smoking cigars, like some people can look kind of like, ooh. Like they're sweaty all the time. That kind of douche look. And some people can look like that person looks sweet. How do you how do you rate me right now? Oh my god. Now you, you look I like a Cuban general. Okay. Like yeah. that's a and that's meant as a compliment, right? Like you look like somebody who is naturally having a good time smoking a cigar. Not like kind of the frat boy party cheap cigars. And I think that's the difference is just your comfortability with it and your confidence in it you know if you don't feel comfortable with it or you're you know that comes across very easily yeah it's kind of like are you smoking it because you enjoy it or are you smoking right. it to look cool and the ones smoking it to look cool, cool yeah douchey right they lose it you can't lose it Douche you got to keep it together no, I'm just saying that's tough. Like you can't, you can't fake that. Yeah, you, it's got to be genuine. Yeah. If it's genuine, you can pull it off. No, okay. So where is the cigar business? Is it, is it up? Is it down? Same as it ever was. Let me tell you, man. Uh, since COVID hit, it, it it we've been in a mini boom. So I think people being home allowed them more time to actually learn about cigars and maybe understand them more and also because now people are working from home so you're not in an office all day so where you would have had maybe one cigar at the end of the day or maybe on the weekend now people especially in the summertime you have your computer you're in your back backyard you're on your porch you're able to have a cigar while you're working so it, it's been really amazing to see the industry strive. I mean, we're not growing in leaps and bounds, you know, but maybe we're, we're up, I think about 3% this quarter and overall imports of, of handmade cigars into the United States. Is there right? Like, okay, there's the health concern question, right? That either wherever it is in terms of whatever it is. Right. But is, is, is there still, is there a stigma around cigars? Do you feel like you guys are always kind of fighting that? 
we've been through some really serious battles with the FDA over the past two years. And we luckily have been able to have been carved out and not regulated like cigarettes and machine-made cigars. So they've been coming at us. I've been fighting this uh, via our trade organization, Cigar Rights of America, which I encourage any cigar smokers to, to join. And we've been really working hard in educating Washington that, first of all, kids don't smoke our products. This is not something where, you know, kids have $10, $20 of disposable income to smoke cigars. What has been increasing is machine-made cigars that are being purchased in C stores, convenience stores, and gas stations. Because of the legalization of cannabis, that market has exploded. You know, so, and those are generally 99 cents. They're generally homogenized, what we call homogenized tobacco, which was actually developed in Connecticut in 1955. It's basically tobacco dust and paper that's made on these huge machines and rolled out. And those are generally sold in gas stations and convenience stores. To give you an idea of the difference, you know, handmade cigars between Nicaragua, Honduras, and the Dominican, you're probably looking about 320 million units that are imported into the United States, which seems like a lot, but the machine-made market is at about 15 billion units. So 15 billion, oh, wow. say 300, 300 million. So, and then that's just machine-made cigar. That doesn't include all the other tobacco products, cigarettes, you know, smokeless tobacco. So we are less than a fraction of a percent when you look at the overall uh, pie of tobacco products. So, you know, we've always argued that we are not selling to, to kids. This is not, you have to be ID need to go into a cigar shop and you're not, you know, there are health effects with everything, you know, drinking with, of course, smoking, but, you know, they're compared to something that's being inhaled into your lungs. It's a complete, the FDA actually released studies that two to three cigars a week had zero or little health impacts. And, you know, it's, again, it all depends. My grandfather just passed away a couple of years ago and he was 94. He smoked cigars since World War II, you know, um, you know, it's not the, the greatest argument, but we know a lot of people that have smoked cigars. A, a lot of art, people argue that it's really a stress relief with cigar smoking. Uh, Larry David and Seinfeld had a great piece on uh, cars, cars and comedians getting coffee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he said, what is it about a cigar that and Larry David said, a cigar is is relaxing. It's this. You have time. A cigarette is you're, yeah, you need yeah, it. yeah. You need it. It's it's a stress. It's a it's a habit. It's something. So when you're smoking a cigar, it's it is time. It's relaxation, which I think definitely has, you know, good good benefits. Since since you brought up a celebrity, we'll go into this one. Yeah. Celebrity who knows their stuff. That's a great question. I mean, as far as cigar smoker, Michael Jordan's a big cigar smoker, although he's. I think a big a Cuban fan. Um, I think he's just starting now to, to a lot of people are starting to discover the world of, of Nicaraguan cigars. Um, I, I would say he knows what he's doing. Um, I, I think Larry David actually knows his cigars pretty well. Um, I, a friend of mine, uh, D nice. He was from one of the first hip hop bands. Uh, he knows his stuff really well he's a he's a famous dj there's a lot of a lot of guys uh behind the scenes that really really know their stuff so guys that really get into it joe rogan right now is really getting in, into it his i think he's come a long way over the past like three years of what he's kind of learning and, and knowing about cigars is that kind of your experience with people right when they get once they get turned on to them like they go it seems like something like people get into. Yeah, it's because there's a lot to it. And I think once people have a, a, a picture of 
of the world, it, it becomes very, the cigar world, it becomes very interesting. And the process, there's not many processes. You know, this process of handmade cigars is this almost the same that it's been for the past, you know, 200 years. So there's not many industries, I think, that still exist that, you know, existed 200 years ago. And really, when you start getting into it, it's, it, it is an amazing world to learn about the process and then just who you meet from the cigar world you know working at a cigar store you meet people that you wouldn't normally meet or would converge in the same place and the vehicle is cigars so i would i would meet and still you'd meet billionaires blue-collared workers musicians artists all of these different types of people come to this one place that normally i don't think would ever spend time together per, like is there a price point that is a sweet spot that you would say like oh you don't have to spend this much but you need to spend this much like is there a price point where somebody either with your business or with others that you'd be like that's a you're gonna do pretty well right there so i would answer that in two parts i would say between nine and fifteen dollars you can get really amazing cigars amazing cigars top rated amazing cigars you could also get a really good cigar between five we make a cigar called charter oak which is my homage to connecticut and the connecticut cigar world charter oak is the image of actually uh the symbol of harford connecticut and we received the number one best value cigar from cigar aficionado and so you can get a great cigar between five. You're not going to get the depth and complexity that you're going to get in the range between nine to 15. But what you're getting is really good for the price point. So it would be more of a cigar that you would, you know, maybe if you're cutting the lawn or you're kind of doing things and you don't have the time to really sit down and focus on something that would kind of be more the cigar, you know, for you. But between nine and fifteen dollars, man, you're you know, you're getting an amazing, you know, some of the best tobaccos in the world. I think a lot of the other price points, a lot of times it's you know, it is marketing. I'm coming out this November with the most expensive cigar that I've ever come out with, but it's for a special reason. We're doing the hundredth year anniversary of King Tut's discovery. Uh, this is a replica of a box that was discovered within King Tut's tomb. So I work, yeah, I work with a, a company, a place called High Clear Castle. That's cool, man. Isn't this cool? We actually had a Yale Egyptologist work on all of the hieroglyphs, so they're legit. So I work with High Clear Castle in England. High Clear Castle is owned by Lord Carnarvon whose great grandfather discovered King Tut's tomb with Howard Carter. He funded Howard Carter and was an amateur archaeologist. So I make a cigar. It's the only cigar I make for someone else called High Clear Castle. And they tapped me to make a hundredth year anniversary of King Tut's uh, cigar in November because his great grandfather smoked cigars and was smoking cigars when the, the, the tomb was discovered. So this is going to be one of my my most pricey uh, projects, but there's a lot that goes into it. How much? How much do you sell? Thirty. There were thirty three dollars. Oh, I thought you were going to uh, say like five thousand yeah. bucks. Yeah, they, <laughs> I was like, Dang. yeah, yeah. No, this is. I mean, again, you know, for everyday smokers, you don't have to be spending a crazy amount of uh, money. That is one of the questions, right? And I'm sure you knew we were going to get this one. It's like most expensive cigar you've ever smoked and was it worth it? The most most expensive one I would say was uh, probably a Cuban from 1945. It was a Partagas that a friend gave me. That would probably be the most expensive cigar. It's, it's really about the experience of having something that old. Um, what, as far as... You know, the blend, a lot of times these older cigars, there's this misconception conception that always older is better and when it comes to aging cigars. And there's it's not always the case. And a lot of times is that the tobaccos, it's, a, it's an alive living plant. 
with that much time, it loses a lot of its cellular structure and a lot of its its flavor always time. So it was good. It was very mild, but I don't know if I would, you know, actively, if I had access, purchase, you know, cigars and and smoke those cigars if I was in the in the position to do so, even if I had, you know, money to spend on on cigars of that expensive. How much would that have been then? That's a good question. It was probably probably in the five hundred dollars range from three to five hundred dollars for one cigar. Man, it's interesting. You know, we interviewed a guy who was a whiskey critic, and then I'm yeah. all combining that interview in my mind with a documentary I watched about whiskey. And all those guys yeah. who are like the master blenders, they're like, we sm- like we drink stuff that's six years old. The older stuff's really not that not that great. It's the same. You'll find that with cigar, you know. I work with mainly Cubans and it's the same way, you know. A lot of these tobacco guys, they they chew on their cigars, you know. But a lot of that is mystique. A lot of it is is the rarity, the supply and demand. That's what really drives right. up That's what uh, the price is. There's only X amount of boxes. You know, it's the same with, with the cigar I'm doing, the King Tut cigar. There's only going to be 700 boxes. You know, it's it's supply and demand a lot of times. <laughs> this one, This one might require some thought, man. Movie or TV show? in which the person looked coolest holding a cigar. Oof. Like, oh, that that was a cool oh, scene. Christmas. Yeah. Oh, uh, you know what I would say? I would say uh Gene Hackman Chris Chris uh, Tide with Denzel what is Washington. The name of that damn movie? Is it Chrisman Tide? It's either I, cri- I think it's Chris Oh crap, once you try to say it, you like can't say it. Crimson. I know. Crimson. What does that even mean? I'm terrible. Reddish, I guess. I always thought it was a movie about That's right. somebody getting killed. Crimson. Have you seen it? No. It's a great movie. Oh, it's in a phenomenal movie. I just Crimson Tide. Gene Hackman. I know what movie you're talking about. It's the it's submarines and shit. Correct. The reason There's... that I haven't watched it is because there was a movie called Prince of Tides, which was a romantic comedy. That I was like, I'm not watching anything about time. Inconceivable. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Inconceivable. There's a great scene at the beginning of the movie before they submerge. And it's Gene Hackman and Denzel Washington as their, I don't know what the you call the lookout point. And they're just getting ready to submerge. And he's smoking a cigar and gives Denzel one. And there's this moment of silence. And he said, you didn't mess it up. You let the silence go. Gene Hackman to Denzel. Most people would want to occupy the space and with chit chat. And you just enjoyed the moment. And they're smoking. He's smoking a cigar. And he looks badass because he's comfortable. You can tell he's he's a cigar smoker. And he's cool. The only one I was thinking of when they mentioned it was in, uh, I can't remember if it's Predator or Commando. But I think it's Predator. Arnold Schwarzenegger oh, yeah. is just like, like you yeah. can see he's got it all the time. Like oh, he had it down. Arnold's a big cigar smoker. Yeah, he knows his stuff. He knows too. how to do it right. Um, but again, it's what you like too. It's like when you know, no, you know your stuff is 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 what you like. Who who's to tell you what you should be enjoying and what you shouldn't be enjoying? I think it gets clicky a lot of times when you go into cigar shops, maybe. Yeah. You know, it gets like, you know, the, the real hardcore guys, it, you know, think they, they kind of know everything. And uh, it's really about, again, what you enjoy. Uh, that's all the questions I got, man. Is there anything else you think people should know or what's kind of coming up for you? Where can people find you? Where can people get the cigars? All of that kind of stuff. So www.foundationcigars.com. I think I forgot a W, but you, people, you guys yeah, know. We'll figure it out. <laughs> foundationcigars.com we have a great store locator we don't sell directly to consumers so we only sell via cigar shops throughout the country so you can find on our website a store locator for a shop near you we're all over instagram foundation cigars i am under nick r agua that's my that's my instagram handle i like it i like it i like it agua 
we are actually get gearing up to open up a brand new office on a hundred acre tobacco farm in the Connecticut River Valley. So it's really going to become the forefront of Foundation Cigars, this connection between Connecticut and Nicaragua. So I hope to embark on educating a lot more people about the history of, of cigars and tobacco within the Connecticut River Valley because it's it's really a national treasure. It's the Napa Valley of of Connecticut. And uh, I'm hoping, you know, we're going to get into our new office. It's been a lot of delays here over the past two years with, with supply chain and COVID. So in September, we're, we're looking forward to moving in. And then hope, hopefully next season, we'll be able to have people come up and, and eventually start tours to really educate people about the process. So I'd love to have you up at some time. Yeah, man. The East Coast. I, I did yeah. not know that Connecticut was big into cigars. I would have never known that. Yeah. they. You know, most of the guys are farmers. So they really, over the past hundred years, didn't do a great job marketing and oh yeah too busy know, working to, of, to work right too busy working yeah a lot of farmers are not necessarily marketing and in, inclined to to marketing in general and the state hasn't really done a great job because of course tobacco politically tobacco doesn't have any uh you know it's not positive for any politicians to to kind of back so we're we're kind of taking the lead with some of my friends in the Valley and new generations of, of tobacco growers there to educate the world about the Connecticut river Valley. If somebody gave you one option for what to do for that day, you can do anything you want. What does John Shaw want to do that day? Probably go on a binger, probably go bar hopping. See, I want to do absolutely nothing. That's my dream. I can agree with you. What do you what do you do to relax? I have to wait till everybody in my house is asleep and I have to put technology away. Like that's probably more so technology than my entire house being asleep for me to relax. I just I got to get away from technology. Your brain is just always active. If you're using your phone, right? Like it's pretty addictive or if you're looking at the computer, it's pretty addictive. But to really relax for me, like I've got to just Nothing. I just sit outside on my patio, <laughs> and you, ripped out of my mind, staring at trees. So let me ask you this: You, you kind of bring up an, a, a question uh, or, a, or, or a topic that I, I wonder. I don't do a lot of uh, herbal medicine, so to speak. Uh, do you think you could relax without that? Not to that level. No, I don't think so. It's more of like. That's the difficulty, I think, but I don't think that it has anything to do necessarily with that particular substance in and of itself. I think, though, whenever you're in some kind of situation and you're doing something that enhances that situation, right? Like, what if you really like to sit on the couch and then you discover video games? Well, now I really like to sit on the couch and play video games. I think anything that you kind of discover like that then becomes a little bit of a crutch. The difficulty is keeping that under control, right? Because I'm up to, like, 30 milligrams now and i'm just wondering in my life like how long before i'm taking a hundred <laughs> uh, i mean you could probably take a hundred in a night right i mean if you started early enough you could probably get to a hundred yeah yeah i just you have to i think that's for me right like i know that that situation i love it too much i like drinking way too much i love smoking way too much so I have to just limit myself like, nope, I do this on Friday and Saturday and that's it. Because otherwise I would just wake up in the morning and <laughs> drink and smoke all day, every day. Because I fucking love it. You're talking to a guy who's killed his liver twice. I get it. Uh, addiction. It's, it's addiction essentially, right? But when is addiction crossover? Well, I'm getting real philosophical here. Uh, nobody cares. Uh, but when does addiction cross over into like, not being a relaxation technique anymore like it becomes an addiction like i think you have it figured out a couple times a week it's fine but if you're abusing well, it i think it's when you can't control it if you can't have a good time without it then you need to step back Would but i enjoy just sitting outside like i love sitting outside that's my favorite thing if i can enhance that experience through drugs and alcohol then i enjoy it more <laughs> But I still enjoy it without it. What? It's more kind of like, well, wait, why wouldn't I put chocolate sauce on ice cream? You know what my phrase is of the week? 
Well, clearly no. <laughs> but you're what, supposed to say, um, what is that, Smoke them if you got them? Not, you know, not, uh, not the smart One ass. in the pink, two in the stink? Well, hey, now. I don't uh, know. Okay. YOLO, man. You just got to. How is that your phrase of the week? Just that, th this is starting to piss me off. <laughs> this is starting to piss me off about society is that every single thing that we decided 10 years ago or 20 years ago when you and I were growing up because we're both in that 35 to 40 age range when you and I were growing up all the stuff that we decided was stupid is now suddenly cool again. I think every generation has their their points that they leave behind right like cars or uh, advancements of technology whatever but. I, I feel like phrases and sayings are things that are timeless. I mean, YOLO is a, it's going to be, it's endless. It's timeless, man. I don't think so. I think cool is timeless and dude is timeless. YOLO, it's been replaced by, I think, full send. <laughs> all the way up was before that. Like, I'm all the way up. I'm turned up. Like, every so, generation well, has a slightly different one. Like, you're reaching back 10 years and trying to make Booyah cool again. <laughs> Booyah. Man, well, nobody says Booyah. At least not, not around my nobody my Nobody says YOLO. I, that, you're the first person who no way. has said that that I've heard in 10 years. YOLO is a way of life. It's a way of life. <laughs> it's a way of life. You right. only live once, which is why I had a double bacon cheeseburger today from Wendy's. I hate that kind of mentality, though, honestly. Like, I hate when, when people say that life is short. I think that's incredibly misguided. Life's not short. It's the longest thing you're ever going to do. The challenge isn't to make life short. The challenge is this is a marathon. Like, how do you make sure you're still sprinting at the end? The, I agree with you to, to a certain degree. However, I, I do feel like the, the, the sayings are, were, are presented to kind of force you into things. You know, uh, make you feel it's like a marketing tactic. It is. Uh, however, you know, I, some things in life, you just have to YOLO. You know, you just have to booyah. You just have to get it. I agree with that. But I don't think the idea that like you only live once life short. Like, no, it's not. It's the longest thing you're ever going to do. I mean, YODO. Why not? You only die once. Listen, we're, we're going down a very philosophical path here. I'm just going to say YOLO, and uh, let's YOLO to some shout-outs. How about that? I actually want to know, do you smoke cigars? Uh, I have. I don't on the regular, probably because I don't search them out. Um, and uh, to me, the I think I've only had them when I've been quite inebriated, and I just remember every time uh, thinking to myself, how long is this thing going to take? You're supposed to relax. It is a time investment. It is. That I, other things don't necessarily require. Yeah, I, I am not a cigar aficionado by any stretch. I'm the guy that... <laughs> I pick my nose yeah. so much now, it's ridiculous. You're wearing your shirt inside out. You're picking your nose. Who are you? Somebody called me out about being a mouth breather on the internet. <laughs> and it's you... absolutely... It's true. I breathe through my mouth. You sure they weren't But it's because I don't have a sense of smell, so I breathe through my mouth. Like, why would I ever breathe through my nose? You get way more oxygen in through your mouth. Like, look at this. <sighs> look how much oxygen I'm getting. You should breathe through your mouth. That's superior oxygen. Look how much oxygen you just got. And I got Flowers are looking brighter. And I got big lungs. Body's so. feeling better. It... <sighs> should we take five seconds to have everyone do a breathing technique now? Just... You can't breathe nearly as deeply through your nose. I'm more efficient. Yeah, I look stupid, but I looked stupid before. I actually can breathe. I think I can. I can breathe pretty deep through my nose. I think. Anyways, uh, let me try. Yeah, see, it's good. Not even close. I'm getting at least two to three times more oxygen. Now breathe through your mouth. I mean, of course, there's more volume. It's like, you know, whatever. You should start doing that weird thing you do. Like, you're like... Oh, that, that. Yeah. Nick's been doing that ever since I've known him. And it's like, you got some boogers trapped in your throat? What's up? Do you know what something I found out that my wife convinced confessed to me the other day? Is that her and her very close family and friends had talked about the weird sound that I made. And like, like what's his deal? 
<laughs> I never knew that anybody has ever had that kind of conversation. Like, what's going on with him about me? Have you ever found out that someone had that kind of conversation about you? Like, what's with John? Um... No, not that I can. Not, I mean, not that I, I can think of. Um, no, I'm sure they have. I'm not saying that there hasn't been. I just not that I can recall. It's a weird. It's an interesting thing to find out that people are legitimately like not just talking shit about you, but like wondering like what's going on with that guy. Like, what's this guy's deal? What's this guy's deal? Why is he wearing right. a shirt okay. inside out? Big told you because I'm too cheap to buy new shirts I and I can just turn it inside out. And it's like having two shirts. All right, let's. Let's give some shout outs, shall we? Please do. Shout outs. All right. Uh, Drew Baker. DB. Jo- Johnny Chaney. Johnny Boy. Xavier Payne. Big Zane. Ben Munson. Big Ben. Ben Mo. <laughs> <laughs> ben Moon. Uh, Judith Medvar. Medivac. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Rennie Gibbons. RJ, RG. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Uh, Rosinda Balagnase. Fuck. <laughs> DeAndre Smith. D Smith. That's uh, an easy one. Cassie Heinrichs. Big Cass. And uh, Nicole Graythorn. Nikki. Nikki G. Thorny. Uh, I was actually. Ooh, that's bad. That would be better. Yeah. You're actually quite start terrible that, at nicknames on the fly. Like, as I was reading these, I was like, man. Medivac. Oh, well, what are you coming up with then? I mean, uh, Xavier Payne. What did you even call? What, what was that one? Do you remember? Well, I would have. In, in hindsight, I would have gone like Mr. Payne. Yeah, man. Bring the pain. Uh, yeah. You know, Ben Munson. Uh, I probably would have gone like the Munsonator. Uh, you know, just things like that. No. Anyways. All right. I uh, knew a guy named. I knew. A, it's difficult when you know somebody with names similar to that and you're kind of like, hmm. You kind of ruined that name for me. Well, uh, the ten people that we that we picked out this week, I, I hope I hope we uh, made you feel special. Uh, all right, a couple of questions here, a couple of banners. Uh, are you a puffy Cheetos kind of guy or a crunchy Cheetos kind of guy? You know what, man i I go back and forth. It's tough, it right? depends. It depends. Now, if they're spicy, I'm going to kind of go try to go for the crunchy Cheetos. I like my spice to be crunchy okay. and my cheese to be puffy. Okay. That, uh, okay. Um, I'm just curious. What about this, you? This, uh, I'm going to go crunchy all day. I don't like puffy things. I, I'm not a big puffy fan. You have a puffy jacket, though. That you were pretty excited that your wife got you at Costco. I do. Wow. How do you remember that? <laughs> because I can envision you in a puffy jacket and it makes me laugh every fucking time. It's a warm. <laughs> it's looking like the Michelin man. Fantastic. <laughs> like it's... the guy like just waddling down the street. Just I, I, I was a big critic of the puffy jacket until I got a puffy jacket. And now I feel pretty sweet. Oh, yeah. Well, as you should. And you're welcome, by the way, for, for the idea. Uh, would you rather live in 1969 or 2069? 2069, purely because of hygienic reasons. It's just got to be cleaner. I would always rather live in the future than the past because whenever I watch like historical things, all I can think about is like, man, what did those people probably smell like? And look at all those clothes they had to wear, just sweating all the time without air conditioning. I would always rather live farther in the future purely for comfort reasons. All right. I'm going back to the 60s, so. Why? Because there was an originality of life. There was a, you know, it was just, I'm not, I'm not a big tech guy, right? I'm not saying you are either, but it would have been nice just I know to what you mean, put on a record and just chill and just drink one kind of beer and smoke pot, you know, like, and it's, you know, it is. I, I do think we have too many choices now. Yeah. Right? Like, just, there's too many. I can't handle all Everyone choices. needs a just... trophy. Oh, here we oh, go. Boy. All right. Hey, listen. Good news. It's September. You know. I was, was waiting. I was going to pretend like I didn't know. Oh, man. And just I've, see what you did. I. All right. You ready? I this. Can I'm, I do my intro? Sh- sh- sure. Now it's time 
for the outlaw candle connoisseur himself. Candle of the month. 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 <laughs> Whoops. Right. Outlaw candle connoisseur. Right. <laughs> well done. Well done. I'm actually. Just uh made that up. This is uh, really so wild. far my favorite candle that I've ever showcased on this on this program. Uh, favorite candle ever, or just favorite candle you've showcased? Showcased. I mean, it's up there. Okay. It's okay. it's awesome. But uh, so it's it's a uh, it's by Homesick. It's uh, it's kind of pricey. It's one wick, but it's kind of pricey. It's a uh, forty dollars. Damn uh, for a one wick candle. Yeah. So it's it's a thicker. What are you doing over there, money bags? It's a thicker wick, but it is only one wick. Uh, but it's Bonfire Nights, and it's uh, mm. it's awesome. It uh, so it's uh, it's a tri- it's not labeled as a tri layer candle, but starts off kind of mahogany, kind of woody. The middle of it is a little more sweet. I, I thought maybe they were trying to go with like a maybe a um, like a s'mores type of type of smell, and then it, and it, then it finishes up with like a very crisp, you know oak wood type of smell it's 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 awesome check it out bonfire nights uh homesick.com it is kind of pricey but uh you know it'll burn like for 40 to 60 hours which you know if you if you do the burn time per how much that is per like minute you're actually getting a quite quite a good deal so. it's a dollar an hour <laughs> and, and it's worth it it's worth every dollar I was wondering what you were going to do with Candle of the Month because, right, like we're coming out of summer, but we're going into fall. Like, was it going to be a summer candle? Because it would be too early to have the fall scents. Yeah. So, but so, I think that's a good selection. You really b- balanced it. That's yeah. why you're the right, right. outlaw candle. <laughs> outlaw candle connoisseur. Watch. Watch. How uh, much was the most expensive single candle you've ever bought? I mean, you've that's asked, a $40 candle. I mean, you've asked me this. The, uh, I mean, well, no, I think you actually asked me how much have I spent in total. Uh, right. I mean, there's a couple of three wick candles that have been over 50 before. Um, mm. But, you know, this this one's a little different, I, I guess. Uh, I've never I, I had never bought anything from Homesick before. Um, this was recommended to me by somebody, actually, that I know, uh, another candle connoisseur. And uh, man, or, man or woman, real quick. Uh, a woman, actually. Hmm. Yeah. Is there are a lot of male candle connoisseurs. <laughs> you know, Any recommendation. If anyone remembers me on this podcast for anything, just remember my love of candles. I don't know how anyone could forget. Do you think people That's actually should be on your tombstone? The man loved candles. Do you think people like look forward to the turn of the month episode just to hear what my candle of the month is? unclear i mean people do comment about the candle of the month and i would say that you know a lot about candles you probably know more about candles than anything else in your life no that's not true what do you know more about than candles there's uh women like people would come to you people would come (laughs) to you like what should i do what should i get here john i mean like nobody's asking you about taxes or car repair I mean, I'm not I'm, home insurance. I'm not going to debate you on that. I, I think you're correct, but I also, I mean, I know a lot about sports. I know a lot about certain sports. Um, it's easy to do when you're a bandwagon fan who changes teams in sports every five minutes. Listen, you know, it's like, pretty easy to have. Like Tom Brady said a, a week or so ago, uh, you know, I'm 45. Shit happens, you know, and I, no, he, not one reporter or journalist in that room said a damn thing to him when he said that. You can't because that's absolutely true. Like for people who are younger and look, I was this person too that was like hearing older people than me at that age saying like, God, life gets, no, man, life gets fucking busy. Yeah. Like at 35, once you have kids and you have a job because you're kind of more in a management role potentially at that point in your life and your parents are getting older and you got to take care of them. Like life gets fucking busy. It gets hard. Between like thirty five to forty five, I would say, is probably the most time demanding, stressful time of most people's lives. And that's really essentially probably when you're at your best. You know, you might have a little bit of money because you've been working for a while. Uh, physically, you know, uh, you're you're probably there at the end, or or at least feeling pretty good. And here all you do is fucking worry the entire 10 years. And then you come out and you're decrepit and hurting and it's terrible. Well, 
you're also transitioning in a point of your life where you're not a young person anymore and you're kind of preparing for the rest of your life. It's hard. 35 to 45 is, that's a tough time. And like for people who are younger and I was this person too, like I said, like whatever, man. Like, no, it gets, it gets tough. Well, good thing right we, around that age. Good thing we like, all. That's when life starts. <sighs> Go ahead and say it again because I interrupted you a little bit, and I know you want to say it. Good thing we YOLO. <laughs> you know, well I, I doing this podcast with you now for like four years. I I have a, a deeper appreciation for actors and voice actors and things. Um, I'm sure I sound like a goofball, and probably don't enunciate a lot of my words correctly. Uh, I can't imagine doing it like, you know, uh, for a movie or something and having to get the notes right and, you know, bring across a certain, you know, deflection or dialection. It must just be terrible. Stressful as all hell. And then there's the fact that it's essentially just me and you and we've been friends for a long time. Like imagine doing that in front of, I don't know how many people, five, a yeah. hundred people that's... at the same time. Like that's got to be, and everybody's like, all this depends on you, man. Yeah, that's nice. Right, we're all waiting on you. Uh, okay, are you ready for our top five? Top, f- I I did I did want to talk about one thing real fast. Okay, all right. One, it, it's space related. Oh, here we go. Jesus Christ. What do you think about the Artemis One moon rocket that was scrubbed because of leaky uh, engines? Uh, two things. One, never heard about it. Two, probably a good I think to go ahead and scrub that for a reason. Oh, all right. Yeah, like I mean, I, I don't I, know anything about rocket science. What do you want me to say? Well, no, you know what? They really should have checked the blast capacitors on that. And I can't believe that the NASA tech engineer and mechanical engineering didn't pick up on the fact that the fluid dynamics weren't going to be right. First off, you sounded really educated there. Second, <laughs> secondly, I was talking more about the fact of you know uh, NASA. We're going back to the moon. You know, here we go. Blah blah blah. Space. Oh, is that what we were doing? Yeah, we were. It was an unmanned. Uh, mission but like kind of like a test run for hopefully in 2025 to get back to the moon that's what's amazing to me is that in 2025 we will again have reached the level of technology that we did when we did first got there yeah in 1960 whatever so i i found it fascinating and well, we don't have to talk about this a whole lot but i found it fascinating a lot of the conspiracy and, and reddit uh you know dweebs were, were talking about so you're basically NASA basically admitted the fact that the landing in 69 was was fake. No, they didn't. I, well, I, I don't agree with them, but it does raise some questions as to why they could successfully do it back then. And we, we haven't even thought about it uh, uh, in, what, 60 years? Okay, so as a former reporter who used to cover NASA and go out to the Kennedy Space Station Center, all that kind of stuff. I can actually tell you the answer. Right. It's because if you look at the space race back in the 1960s when we were doing that and the percentage of our budget, the national budget that went towards that, that's why. We essentially were investing a huge amount of our resources into that technology and a huge amount of our interest into it. It was, a, it was basically for our national pride and for our national defense to get there before Russia did. We don't do that anymore. So it's kind of like, how come you can't lift as much? Like, you can lift a lot more weight when you put 50% of effort into it as opposed to when you put five. That's really the reason. Hmm. You want to hear my conspiracy theory rant? I think we all do. You never go on rants, so go ahead. Okay, here's my conspiracy theory rant. The reason that I don't believe in any conspiracy theories is because of logistics. Anybody who has ever been a project manager or tried to organize more than three people knows that there's no possible way that any conspiracy theories could exist. Because think about what it would take to fake the moon landing. You've got to rent out a studio. Well, there's a paper trail for that. How many people know about that? How many people are involved in the process of filming it, of acting it? And over all of these years, it's never come out. Like, there's got to be a line. This is the government. We're talking about a budget. So somewhere there has to be a line item. Like, hey, what's this charge for renting out this studio on Fifth Street? What is that? Like, there's all of these questions that were going to be involved. And just logistically, you can't do that. There's too many people involved. There's too many questions. For any kind of conspiracy theory, name it and logistics will rip it apart. Like, how are you going to do that? 
I think you should just drop the mic and I'll see you next year. Okay. I mean, right. Like if you've I mean, ever been a project manager, it's not possible. These things can't come together. Yeah. I mean, uh, once again, I agree with you. I, I can't really play the devil. Except for Jeffrey Epstein. I believe that shit. I can't really play the devil's advocate uh, on this because I, I agree with you. I, there, there is enough of, uh, of evidence wise and enough people involved that at some point in the last 60 years, something like hard actual proof would have came out like a receipt right or, or or you know or somebody would have came out you know and as far as i know there hasn't actually been somebody that's come out that's been credible that said hey nobody's ever said yeah. anything like i'm the camera guy who you know who filmed them in the studio in la or something right like and who designed the moon you got to get set designers in there you got to get people like what's this receipt for bringing in all these rocks and, and why do we have an artist suddenly coming in <laughs> like we're it just no. Well, and all those things, like, think of how complicated anything that you do is. Well, how many people are involved? It just doesn't happen. Once again, you and I working in television, uh, I mean, imagine the lighting it would take, and you'd have to have all those people. They're probably union. So that now you get right. the union all this involved. Stuff. Yeah. So I, I agree with you. It's, yeah. a, it's a very good point you brought up. So, all right. Well are you done. ready for our top five finally? I am, man. Let's go to school. All right. So our top five is top five school supplies. What's your number five? You got to have a good pencil case. A pencil case? Yeah. Well, pen, pen or pencil case, but you got to have a good pencil case, man. Like, uh, you didn't roll with one of those when you were in like elementary school? No. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, 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 I would have like a, like sports teams. So I had a few. Are of you them. talking about a lunchbox? No, no. That's that's coming up. I'm talking about a pencil case, something that would I would just have just to store my pens and pencils. My number five is wide out because that's when you're getting to the big leagues at school. You got chemicals. You're getting trusted with chemicals. You're getting wide out. The little kids don't have wide out. It's, it's, you're writing. You're it's writing fine. on. You're, you're going into the permanent. You're going. You're doing stuff that's permanent. It's fine. I'm not. I'm not going to hate on it. I don't. I mean, it's, I, it's not on my case. top five, but. Okay, uh, what's your number four? <laughs> you're really going to. Hate this one, uh, probably if you hated that one. A uh, trapper keeper. I I thought about putting trapper keeper as number one. Ultimately, left it off my list, but I could have gone trapper keeper as number one because it sets the stage for all of the rest of the school supplies. Yeah, not not to mention once again, you're gonna find a theme on my list, which is customizability. So, oh yeah, you could get them in different See, but... colors, different shapes, different teams. My parents were too cheap. Oh. They were like, you're getting the red one. You can have a choice, red or blue. You're not getting like this one. <laughs> but mom, like this one's got superheroes on it. That's 98 cents. And this one's 49. Oh, man. What's your number four? <laughs> pen. Just a pen. I like pens. Okay. Uh, <laughs> my, num <laughs> my number three is a good glue stick. Mmm. Now, do you have the glue bottle above? No. You have glue stick. You're going straight glue stick. Yeah, you're just going like the old school Elmer glue. You know, you twist it at the bottom and that that's what it is. I don't know what was more advanced, though. The glue stick, like, was the glue stick for the kindergartners or was the glue for the kindergartners? And then you worked your way up to the glue stick. No, I, I think the glue stick was uh, was for the kids. And the actual glue was for the uh, slightly older kids. Mm. Yeah, because they probably eat the glue. Did you ever eat the glue? Who was the kid who ate the glue in your class? Of course I did. <laughs> yeah, you were the kid who ate the glue. I mean, I never turned that out a challenge. That is actually perfectly. That is per <laughs> if, if anyone is ever wondering what John is like, there are two things that can tell you exactly who John is. Samwell Tarly from Game of Thrones and the kid who ate glue in the glue cl in your class. You're still going to stick with Samuel Tarly, huh? I'm never going to live that I'm one down. Never going to live that one down. I'm not entirely convinced you're not. <laughs> you are, I'm not entirely convinced you're not that actor. Trust me. I know I'm not because I, I would have a lot more money. Um, There's think, a conspiracy theory right there for you. I, maybe I am. I am. You know, Maybe you're a reincarnation of, of Napoleon. Who knows? Oh, here we go. Uh, I thought a lot about my number three. My number three is a scientific calculator. 
because you could play games on it. And that was like the fanciest school supply you were ever going to get. That was the one that like when you got home, mom was like, where's the scientific calculator? I also love that you and I's lists are, fr- are from like the you know late 80s, early 90s. Right. As we're k- kids of today, it's, you know, their phones, iPads, tablets. We're, you're talking about playing a, what do you play on your calculator, Snake? Yeah, and then you did that thing where you would like you could put it put in certain numbers, and then if oh, you yeah. turn it upside down, it would like spell out boobs. Yeah, four zero zero four. And hell. Yeah, like four three uh, <laughs> one one. I think. I can't believe you remember that. Yeah, I do it at home all the time on my personal calculator. I still don't know what sin, cos, and tan mean. Cosine. Yeah, but what does that mean? I. Fuck if I know. I don't, I don't have a math math degree. I you know. Anyways, yeah. uh, my number two uh, lunchbox. That's a, that's interesting. Oh, it cut you off. Well, I'll start it over all again. Right, but right. that's like really tells you about what. Like people don't even know what the math. Like it was so complicated that they were just like fuck it, just put a button there. Like nobody's ever going to figure this out. Yeah, I mean, what do you even use those? Uh, you know, those functions for. I we, I probably sound really stupid saying that. I'm I have sure. no idea. But uh, there's somebody out there that's like, well, that's how you find you know the square root of 59 or whatever. Like I, I don't fucking know. I don't even think 59 has square root, but it, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I agree doesn't. with you. I have no idea. Okay, what's your number two? Uh, you gotta have a good lunchbox. I was a paper brown paper bag kid. Sometimes, sometimes I was. Uh, was a, a school lunch kid like but like the latchkey lunches we called them which was god knows where they came from but you know it was it was like the when you didn't have money for lunch or something so they would give you a, a like an eight day old apple and a peanut butter and jelly sandwich uh in a brown paper bag you know the lunch at my kid's school like we have a choice between buying in the school and it's nine dollars a day no a day Holy like, shit. Here's here's a piece of bread and a piece of cheese in the middle. On your way, son. I mean, for $9, they better be getting a gourmet lunch for that. I would go there. Like, they better <laughs> allow parents to come in and eat for $9. Get the fuck out of here with that. Yeah, that's... Brown insane. bag, baby. I never got a lunchbox. Yeah, that's insane. I, I had a lunchbox until it got broken, but it's fine. What's your number two? How did your lunchbox get broken? Did you hit a kid with it? No, uh, it was stepped on by another kid. What did he do it on purpose? What was that? Did he do it on purpose? Yeah, of course he did. What was what was on the lunchbox? Do you remember? Yeah, it was uh, Hulk Hogan, actually. Was it because of you or because he didn't like Hulk Hogan? Probably because I was taunting him. Oh, well, then you deserved it. I don't feel bad for you. Well, you know what? I bought the same lunchbox, and it's in a, a safe place now, so... Wait a minute. You still have a lunchbox? I have that lunchbox, yes. It's a highly sought-after collectible item. No, it's not. It is? No, it isn't. How much is it worth? Probably 200 bucks. Okay. that's Let's not talk about it like it's a Ferrari <laughs> or a Shelby Cobra from the 1960s. It is. Right? It's, it's, my, it's my Ferrari, okay? You eat your vitamins, you say your prayers, little boys and girls, and you can be like Hulk Hogan. Well, and take massive amounts of steroids. <laughs> Don't forget about that little part that they left out. Uh, my number two is crayons. Okay, I mean, I, I don't have I don't have any color stuff on my list. Actually, my number one you're gonna get be really disappointed in. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't have crayons, markers, colored pencils, highlighters. Don't have any of that stuff on my list. Okay, what's your number one? A mechanical pencil. I mean, it's cooler than a pencil, but it's not fancy. It's I, I mean, that was my thing, and in, in, uh, in, uh at the end of elementary school, junior high, like that, that that was it for me. I, I would, I remember going school shopping because that was still a thing. I don't even know if kids still do it nowadays. Uh, I would get like the forty count, and like I would just, Damn. I would just stash them. That way, when one What's, ran out, like, and I would, you know, remember how they would give you, like, the cool little refills of, of ink? No? Nope. Well, you would get, like, these... Graphite, I believe, is what it's called. A pencil does not use ink. Yeah, whatever. You would get, like, the the, the little rectangle 
uh, cases that were like hard plastic. You, I, you know, I used to feel so cool walking around with my mechanical pencil and stuff. Did you put it behind your ear? No, but it kind of led to a, a crazy obsession because now I, I literally have to order a certain kind of pen for every aspect of my life, and it's the only kind of writing utensil I use. Wait a minute. Do you use different pens for different things? No. No, it's just, I, I use the same pen for everything, whether it's if I'm at work, if I'm signing a document, if I'm playing a nerd game uh, and, I, and I need something to write with, you know, it's it's the same kind of pen. Same exact I understand. Same I understand it. What kind of pen is it? It's a uh, G2. Who makes it? I don't know what that means. Uh, I believe Give me the price. Uh, well, so I think it's three. Well, it, it's going to depend where you go. But it's three ninety nine at, at Meyer for uh, for a four pack. Um, That's not bad. It's a nice pen, but not crazy. It's not like the Bix where you get ten in a box. You get like four pack or something like that. It's like a Pilot. Well, that that's who makes them Pilot. I know what you're talking about. That's a good pen. It's, they're great pens, best pens ever. Actually, if you want to sponsor us, Pilot, because uh, I know you're an entity and listening, uh, let me know, please. Thank you. Pens and Pilot, pens and candles. Pens, candles, and uh, Captain J's. No, not Captain J's. Oh, my God. Long, Long John, John Silvers. Silvers. There we go. Long John Silvers. My number one is a notebook because it dictated everything else about school, and you could get, when you got older, you could get, get like, different colors for every subject. Yeah, I mean, so I have file folders uh, on my honorable mention. That's what I used, like... Yeah, folders, you know, different colors. If they had the tabs, it was kind of cool to, like, create your own, you know, your own stuff. File folders are the younger version of the notebook where you got different colors for different classes and different things. Yeah, those were... You graduated up to notebooks where you then got different colors. Oh, well, great. What kind of monster would have five college classes and get five of the same color notebooks? You. A psychopath. No, you get all different colors. I wouldn't repeat colors at all. I would go to multiple stores to ensure that I had a different color for every single class. Now, if, if we're talking about, you know, uh, school items for high school and above, my number one would be a planner by far, a day planner. Um, but obviously, I, I kind of broadened it up a little bit. Okay. What's in your honorable mention? You know, I don't, I, don't, I mean, I, I, I kind of mentioned uh, like file folders. Um, you also have to have like a good good eraser just in case. Like you can have the big pink ones that look like a tongue, or you can have you know or it doesn't matter. But you have to have a good eraser. I, and then I, also, I always hated the ones that you put on top of pencils. Like that was stupid oh, those, to me. Yeah, those were. Give me a real eraser. Yeah, you need a you need like a magic eraser. I think is the, that that they're called. Those are those mm. are quality. Yeah, that's true. The individual eraser, not the crap on the like the pen like the cap uh, and some then kind of idiot and then i just uh, i just have highlighters uh, as well you know the only ones we kind of left out that i would include are scissors scissors was a big deal when you got like you graduated like oh you got to get scissors now i went uh my school you weren't allowed to have scissors oh well it is detroit well yeah you weren't allowed to have any sharp i mean i think that's i think that's everywhere you're not you're not supposed to bring sharp objects as a kid to a classroom no, they have scissors for places where you don't get shot every five minutes. Well, whatever. Anything else on your okay, own? Here's, the, here's my last, here's my only other question. When you wore a backpack, did you go one shoulder or two? Uh, one shoulder. I still do one shoulder because I wear a backpack to work every day. But it's supposed to be a two-shoulder backpack. You're not wearing like a satchel or something. Yeah, but it's... Once again, it's something that I did when I was younger, and I, I, I continue it to this day. See, I've always been a two-shoulder person because it's more efficient. And I think if people were to see you and I, they would be able to tell that without even knowing that you are a two-arm backpack kind of guy, and I'm a one -armer. I would agree. I would agree. That's really the only difference between us. It sums up our differences Well, because I like pens too. And six inches everywhere. <laughs> It's kind of good. I'll give you that one. I was trying to think of a way to like, but you, 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 you pushed me out of the comeback when you said everywhere. 
And then I had, because I was going to go there, but then you, like, you covered all your bases. You sunk my battleship. 